All right. Good afternoon, everyone who's joining us today live for our Knowing Wildcats week four webinar today with Christian Bonasic. Today we'll be talking about his work on pumas in Chile and due to the unpredictability of the power in Santiago, we almost pre-recorded this, but we do actually have Christian live luckily, so this will be a lot more fun. Our chat window is open, so say hello to fellow viewers and tell us where you're watching from. We've got uh, a number of people helping out in that window, as well as in our Q&A, where you should type your questions for the presenter, and uh, we will tackle all of those at the end of the talk. So we have a team here ready to direct your questions to the appropriate person. We are happy to provide these complimentary webinars to you during this challenging time. And uh, we've heard from a number of people how much they appreciate this. So thank you and please provide your feedback. I am delighted to introduce Christian now and we'll get started. Dr. Christian Bonasic is a Chilean doctor of veterinary and medicine and a master of science in wildlife management and he holds a PhD from Oxford. Christian is a full professor at the School of Veterinary Medicine and the Department of Ecosystems and the Environment in Catholic University of Chile. In 2016, he was a visiting professor at the Nelson Institute at the University of Wisconsin, founded by the Tinker Fellowship. And in 2016, it was a visiting professor at the Nelson Institute at the University of Wisconsin, supported by the Tinker Fellowship. I think I just said that. Uh, he's, and Christian's been working with Pumas for, he started his lab 20 years ago and has been working with Pumas for 15 years. Right, Christian? All right, I'm gonna let you get started and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me today. I hope you hear my, my voice from far south in the Americas. Today I'm going to talk about the work of many people that is has been part of that. Some of them are Jose Infante, Anita Muñoz, Omar Lawrence. And within 15 years, we have been looking at the problems of mountain lions in Chile in different regions and different ecosystems. Today, I'm going to give you some examples of our work in three main ecosystems. First of all, if we, if we compile the density estimations of pumas along the Americas, we see that some areas of the Americas hold larger populations of pumas, meanwhile some others are uh, dwelling or disappearing. Two of the study areas where we are working in the north of Chile, the Altiplano, the high Andean plateau in the border between Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, we estimated very low densities of puma, and yet they are in conflict with local farmers. Also, in the Mediterranean region nearby Santiago, in the high Andes of central Chile, we also have pumas living and surviving in very difficult conditions with low densities according to our estimate. As we go south, we find larger estimate populations in Patagonia, particularly in Torres del Paine National Park, where we're also working now. Well, puma is the only top predator that we have, the only large cat that we have in Chile. We don't have jaguars in Chile. Let's remind you that Chile is a long strip of land surrounded by the high Andes, on the east side is Pacific Ocean. On the west coast, the Humboldt Current. We, our border with, with Peru and Bolivia is the Atacama Desert. And at the end of the world in Patagonia, our border is with the Magellanic Strait and Antarctica. So <clears throat> it's 3,000 miles long country with multiple ecosystems except tropical ecosystems. So if you want to put Chile upside down in North America, Chile goes from Vancouver to Baja California along the west strip of North America. So we share similar ecosystems with the US on the west coast. 
but upside down. <clears throat> the north is dry and desert, and the south is cold and, and rainy. The history of pumas, as well as other species of wildlife in our country, resembles the situation that happened in the far west in the US too. So farmers and people went to conquer new land, displacing and killing people, local First Nations, and also killing wildlife, particularly mountain lions that were considered a nuisance because they, they prey on domestic livestock. But besides mountain lion, the main prey of puma also disappeared and that means guanacos, vicuñas, Andean deer, viscachas, and other species. So in, in many places along the, the Andes of Chile, we suffer a massive uh, depopulation and decline of the distribution range and population sizes of native prey. Having that in context and considering the situation in the 21st century, in this talk, I want to address three main questions. Why pumas are in conflict with people in Chile? Is it because pumas are recovering and increasing their impact? Or is that pumas prefer to eat domestic livestock because native species are less available? Or finally, are local communities and people invading pumas territories and that increases their negative perception? Those are the kind of questions that I would like to put together in a short time now. First of all, let me set the study sites first. The first studies that I am going to report today belongs to the north of Chile, the Altiplano, the high Andean plateau, a steparic environment, 4,000 meters high plateau surrounded by two branches of the Andes, where the temperature at night is below zero, Celsius and heat and dry weather and high solar radiation makes the, this ecosystem very harsh to survive. And also low concentration of oxygen makes this ecosystem very difficult to breathe. That's the north called the Altiplano and we share this ecosystem with Argentina, Bolivia and Peru. The second part of my work and, and my talk regards to the central Andes or the high mountains uh, nearby Santiago or the central region of Chile, where the lowlands were dominated by Mediterranean uh, ecosystems like shrublands and trees from Mediterranean type like California. And the highlands are, are dominated by rocky mountains and snow and, and glaciers. <clears throat> Finally, I will give a, a brief explanation of our work in the temperate rainforest where our main First Nation lives, the Mapuches in the Araucanía region. We are also doing some work on the south in Patagonia, in the open cold grasslands of Patagonia, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, however, the first picture of a mountain lion is a mountain lion inside a cave in Torres del Paine National Park, where you can go and see mountain lions very easily. So the kind of people that I'm going to talk about and their relationship with livestock and with their livestock, with pumas and other species of wildlife are three. The Aymaras in the north, which is a first nation mainly living in Peru and Bolivia <clears throat> around the Titicaca Lake, which is in <clears throat> Peru and Bolivia. But we still have some small groups of people living in those areas of the Chilean Altiplano. The second, a study site is, is in central Chile where we have our cowboys, the, the, the farmers and called arrieros, <clears throat> who are people that um, herd animals, cows, mainly cattle and horses and goats and sheep to the highlands in summer to use the summer grounds um, for grazing. <clears throat> they are called arrieros. And lastly, in the temperate rainforest, we have the Mapuches. We have done different, in different times, interviews and, and, and discussions with different people in these three groups who are different between them in the way that they farm, in the way that they use the mountains, and they are from different origins. 
<clears throat> but overall, almost 80% or even all of them got negative perceptions about Pumas in their lands. And I will go into that a little bit further later. Today I'm going to talk about the Aymaras in the north of Chile, the Arrieros or Campesinos in the Mediterranean region. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's the pre-recorded thing. <clears throat> okay, let me talk about our research toolkit. We, we try to, to solve practical problems uh, using different methodologies. We are not experts in one particular methodology. And the way that we, we tackle conservation problems in our research group is by creating a multidisciplinary crate where we receive students and conservationists from different disciplines, veterinary students, agronomists, biologists, geographers, and we try to use the techniques that are more, su more suitable for the questions that we have to address. So <clears throat> today, I will give some insight about the autoecology and predator-prey interactions of puma, human perceptions, sp spatial co and co-occurrence analysis in the central region of Chile, and how we have tried to contribute to conflict mitigation and education for conservation. The kind of uh, tools that we use to solve applied problems are interviewing people, knowing how they live and they manage their livestock and how they interact with pumas. You, we use a lot of indirect science, a lot of uh, ground, ground field work, looking for scats, looking for uh, tracks, and looking for, for the presence of <clears throat> prey on carcasses of animals or even carcasses of puma. And we also use camera traps for more than a decade now, and also some studies with field samples of DNA from scats and dead animals. Going into the north, the Altiplano, <clears throat> as I said before, we have done all sorts of studies, but I want to, to say that the Altiplano is a very interesting uh, uh, ecosystem where high quality food for herbivores is concentrated in small patches called bofedales or wet grasslands. <clears throat> Those high quality food patches are surrounded by very arid ecosystem, esteparic grassland and low productivity grassland. So livestock tend to concentrate on those humid or semi-humid grasslands called bofedales. So if you remember last uh, week talk where they show a kind of golf court in Nevada, uh, the, the natural grasslands that are highly rich in terms of nutrient content and very attractive for domestic livestock are like these golf courses, but surrounded by dry desert or very poor vegetation. So <clears throat> in, this, in these patches of vegetation, not native vegetation, farmers herd their animals every day. And at night, they bring them back to stone corrals nearby the, their houses. So what we have in those areas is an extremely high concentration of domestic livestock and a very low concentration or presence of wildlife. And that's important when we study prey preferences of mountain lion. <clears throat> As I said, we use camera traps, we detect scats, and we use different tools, standard tools to study wildlife. In terms of the autoecology, <clears throat> we are also trying to combine the, the, the use of experts or panel of experts trying to identify animals by using cameras from two cameras with lure in the middle, trying to get a picture of, of each animal from both sides. And using a, an, ex, an expert panel, we are trying to identify as many animals as we can in a given study area. In the north, we did fecal DNA ID and using camera records and fecal DNA, we tried to estimate the number of animals in those areas we were, where we were studying the conflict with, with farmers. <clears throat> and we also study the, the, the scats of pumas to understand how important was uh, domestic livestock for them. We have to separate the uh, native domestic livestock, alpacas and llamas, 
and the European ships that were brought many centuries ago and almost replaced in, in, in a big portion the domestic and uh, native uh, species. But there are still, you still find both type of herds. And when we studied the scats of mountain lions in those areas, we found that, of course, the relative biomass of alpacas play a, ma a main role in the, in the, in the scats of mountain lions and also sheep in a second, in a second level. But <clears throat> that is because the size of the animals is large and then the relative biomass become important. But when you actually look into the frequency of the, of the diet of which are the most preferred animals on these patches where livestock is concentrated, grazing and is concentrated, we found out that around those areas of high concentration of domestic livestock, still the scachas, which is a rodent, a native rodent of the Andes, still is the most important or more preferred species in, in the scats, right? So <clears throat> we have a problem and a conflict because pumas actually hunt domestic animals, but most of the time pumas are living from the, the prey that are available even in low densities in those areas like the scachas. Uh, in the north of Chile, many years ago, we started a project trying to understand the perceptions and, and the cultural importance of mountain lion for the elderly people, and also trying to <clears throat> show the, their nature, their wildlife to these children, the uh, primary school children. And so collecting by interviewing elderly people collecting the information and about the, the tales, the stories, and the feeling that they have from their, their ancestors and themselves. We found this collection of, of, of ideas. For example, for the case of Puma, <clears throat> uh, they regarded Puma and Condor as first-class animals that favor, favor the multiplication or reproduction of their livestock, right? Uh, but on the other hand, foxes were considered a minor or less important animal. When they, they, when they hunt a uh, puma, they used to cut uh, uh, their hand and put the money as a, inside the hand of a mountain lion to keep the, their money as a sign of good luck. Those are uh, says or stories from elderly people in those regions where we have a, an extremely low density of people. Only a few hundred people live in some, some small areas in remote areas of the Altiplano. And what we did uh, as one of our first interventions of education for conservation was this wall, this, this painting are in a school, in a primary school wall in a very small town in the Altiplano of Chile in Putre. And <clears throat> we did these tracks uh, for climbing. So the kids could relate the, the track of an animal with the actual animal and the actual size of the animal. So we, we, we tried to bring the animals into their cosmovision, into their way of understanding the wildlife uh, in, inside the the, the patio of their school. And other testimonies that are more recent from our research with one of our uh, uh, researchers, Dr. Omar Orens, where he collected testimonies from people who are farmers and herders of, of alpacas and sheep and llamas in the Altiplano. Uh, <clears throat> some of their says are that they hate the animals that attack their herd when they move around their territories. They say that they eat their livestock, mainly llamas and alpacas, South American domestic camelids, because their, their meat is more tender or they prefer that meat. They also say, and this is an interesting uh, uh, comment, they also say that pumas sometimes transform into humans and, and they walk alone and they are vigilant at night, which is kind of justification for for livestock that is robbed by other people and this mixture of reality with fiction to justify 
when people lose animals because they have been robbed by other people. And <clears throat> they also say the puma causes huge problems. And when we complain to the authorities, particularly police or the wildlife officers, they do nothing. So that's a common complaint of small scale farmers in remote areas of Chile. It's not just in the Altiplano. <clears throat> and some others say they should take the pumas away from our livestock grounds and they should disappear. That's the vision of some of these farmers in remote areas. So here we have Dr. Omar Orens doing workshop in these small places, small farms or small towns in the Altiplano, looking at their perceptions or their conflict with pumas. So one thing and one attempt for mitigation was to use the so-called fox lights. Fox lights were developed in, in Australia to deter foxes from hunting sheep or other species in, in Australia, right? And <clears throat> so with Dr. Omar Orens, we did a, a, an experiment, a control experiment, where we use fox lights around the night grounds or night corrals where uh, the light, their livestock was held at night for protection. And we did an experiment comparing the, and detecting the presence of both predators, mountain lions and foxes, and also uh, using a control experiment where the use of the fox light was shifted to the control sites after a period of time. And the results are, were very promising for the case of pumas. Pumas did avoid uh, to enter an attack uh, uh, livestock uh, when fox lights were present, but Andean foxes were uh, not really deterred at, at all by, by the presence of these fox lights, which is a kind of funny situation as the fox lights were invented to scare foxes in Australia, but it seems that Chilean foxes are much cleverer than European foxes in Australia. Going to the Mediterranean region nearby Santiago, the central region of Chile, where we have the highest density of people, 8 million people live in the metropolitan region. Six or seven out of eight are living in a, in a big city called Santiago. <clears throat> and nearby this area, we have the mountains on the east side of the city and, and the city of Santiago is surrounded by several mountain chains and Santiago is, is enclosed uh, around mountains, with mountains around. So <clears throat> the mountains are very tall. We have up to 6,000 meters altitude mountains. The Aconcagua is the highest mountains, mountain of the whole continent. And we have mountains that are far beyond 5,000 meters too. So in this area, we have deep uh, rivers and, and deep canyons and all sorts of grasslands, steparic grassland, and also a humid or more semi-humid grasslands that we call in this region Vegas. And in this region, we have these farmers and people who herd their animals since colonial times in summer to the high ground for raising this fresh food that is, is left behind as the snow is melting. So basically the, the main, uh, type of livestock here are cows, horses, and also goats and sheep in, in, in a, in, in a less, less frequent. In this area, <clears throat> we have done research for, for many years, but I would say that at least for the last 12, 12 years, we have been looking into the ecology of mountain lion and its relationship with, with Wanakos because we're working in a protected area uh, that was created nearly 30 years ago to protect the Guanacos in the mountains of central Chile, where the Guanacos have almost disappeared. And we have been looking at the spatial uh, ecology of the puma and its relationship with the Guanaco and exotic prey, which are hares and rabbits, and co-occurrence analysis using camera trapping as well. So the guanaco was the main prey of this animal, of this top predator. The guanaco is a 120 kilograms animal that was ex is extremely able to live in different kinds of ecosystems, 
from high mountains to the Atacama Desert, from very hot weather to very cold and snowy uh, places. The only place where he is not comfortable <laughs> is the very wet uh, Valdivian forest. But any, any mountain ecosystem, either dry or cold, Guanacos adapt well. Unfortunately, because of their size and, and they were competitors with the domestic livestock, they were hunted and decimated severely in this part of, of, of Chile. So in, in a protected area called Rio Cipreses, we have been studying the Guanaco since 1984 when I was a, a veterinary student. I did my first practice there in 1984. And then I did my dissertation, my DBM dissertation about, about the habitat use of a small population of Guanaco. And after more than a decade of protection, Guanacos started to recover in, a, in very good numbers. And every winter, counts uh, were made by direct cycling. And we found more than 200 Guanacos by direct count. We also did some checkouts of these direct counts with aerial uh, heli helicopters in, in winter. And, but since 2005, 2007, what we thought was a blooming population of Guanacos recovering after the brink of extinction, suddenly they, had, they started to decline again. And since 2005 onwards, uh, winters are less harsh, less snow is accumulated in, in the highlands, and Guanacos seems to be using uh, winter grounds uh, less, which are the lowlands, and staying in the highlands that were the summer grounds that are less covered by snow. But also, the counts have shown that the animals are declining. So because we have been working on those, those species there, and we started to look into the role that pumas may play in this, in this population in decline. <clears throat> So here is a, is a map of the Rio Cipreses Natural Reserve, which, which is a, a long river going south to north that starts in a, in a glacier system. And on the other side of, the, of this canyon, we have um, private grasslands where people have cows and horses. So we have been studying the ecology of the pumas also outside the protected area. Here you see the Guanacos in winter in the, inside the reserve, but this, this view of Guanacos in heavily snow areas is becoming less frequent as we are facing more than 10 years of drought and warmer weather during winter. Here you have a picture from an aerial count that we did in helicopters and we managed to estimate more than 200 animals in, in the peak of this population. So what is the problem with the Guanacos and the Pumas, how, how they interact in these areas? So we started to study them with uh, camera traps uh, around 2008, 2010. And we started to monitor also the presence of hares in the higher, higher lands or highlands and also the presence of foxes and other species, as well as rabbits uh, below 1,200 meters. So we started to monitor whether the, the core and the temporal overlap of guanacos, hares, and mountain lions, and foxes. So and what is the relationship between, between them, or how the pumas are interacting with them? And so to simplify this idea, we're looking at the ecology of pumas, hare, and Guanaco inside the study area. Here you have a view of the study area in this inside the protected area. Um, I'm advised by former students doing the work with camera trapping and um, with an extensive uh, set of camera trapping uh, uh, surveys uh, in summer and in winter. We have been studying the animals and the presence of Guanacos and hares and pumas in all this area. So the analysis considers activity patterns, predator prey temporal association, spatial co-occurrence, and also simple analysis like habitat use, like the Iblet index. 
The reason that because we're using this very old fashioned habitat use index is because we have the data from my own observations 30 years ago when I did my, my, my dissertation as an undergrad there just with a piece of paper and a pen with aerial photos and paper maps and not camera, not, there were no camera traps, nothing like that. So, but we still managed to, to demonstrate that there was an altitude a habitat use change from winter to summer for the Wanaco. So we wanted to be consistent and recover that information and use that information 30 or years later. So we use, we collect all the scats that we can of Wanakos and foxes. And here you have the Wanakos in the study area, the mountain lion, and the hare somewhere, somewhere there in the, in the corner of the picture. <clears throat> so just to, to make a quick summary of the research that we have done, I'll show you a few graphs about that. Uh, we found that pumas barely use Wanakos and livestock as a food source and they always use uh, hares and, and rabbits in the lowlands all year round. And this is uh, interesting and it, it, is, it is in agreement with Baldi et al. in 2004 that reports that below a certain density when I was become less important on the diet of puma. So pumas in winter uh, survive use hunting hares, which are exotic animals. We, we believe that the hares invaded Chile from the very south of Chile, nearly 3,000 kilometers south from Patagonia. And, and probably there are different estimations when hares became abundant in, in central Chile and in the Andes. But some of the estimations uh, say that hares uh, invaded South America, Argentina, and then Chile in the 17th century. 18th no, 18th century, 19th century. But if the progression of hares coming from the south reach uh, this study area, for sure they are uh, here uh, for less than 100 years. So we call them novel species, and they are alien species too. So <clears throat> through different analysis, like with camera traps, with occupancy models, and other, other more sophisticated models, we managed to map the relationship of this top predator in a very um, depopulated and, um, and poor in terms of biodiversity, in terms of mammal biodiversity ecosystem. And so we, we, we found that pumas hunt when I go, but in very low numbers. Pumas also attack livestock, but not cows mostly uh, uh, foals from, from horses. And the main uh, uh, food item are hares and in secondary level rabbits. And from time to time, small wild micro mammals uh, join the, the, the diet too. In the case of foxes, they mostly live on micro mammals, native micro mammals, and also uh, rabbits and hares. And pumas also can attack uh, foxes too. So this is kind of a description, a simplified version of the of, of years of research of understanding the role of puma. And what is really important is that between 70 to 90 percent of relative biomass uh, that sustain pumas comes from hares. So here you have data from the scats, hundreds of the scats being analyzed, and we continue doing the analysis. And you can see in this blue triangle, inverted triangle, that from time to time we identify one echoes, but it's very, very rare. And <clears throat> the activity patterns of Puma are very close to the activity pattern of her, hers in, in, in both seasons of the year, and also follow the, the activity patterns of rabbits in areas below 1,500 meters of altitude, where we also have done camera trap work. And small mic native micro mammals are less related in their activity patterns with mountain lion, and pumas or mountain lions got no relationship in terms of the time of 
the day where they are active, as guanacos are diurnal, and mountain lions tend to be a more nocturnal or crepuscular animals. <clears throat> In the case of foxes, well, they, these are not good news for foxes because they have to be watching their backs all the time because mountain lions can eat them in both seasons of the year. So pumas have had a high activity pattern overlap with hares and rabbits that are the main prey item for pumas. Pumas seem to adapt and survive due to their high synchrony with the hares and they still use wild micro small mammals, native mammals, but with a limited energy reward and they, don't, they do not seem to play a role on predating guanacos, but we suspect that they do predate guanacos when they encounter them. And we, we suspect that that's one of the reasons because guanacos are declining. And conclusions until now and future steps. And we, we, we think not just in this study area, but in other areas northern from, from this study area, we also found in our, in, in, in our research that hares are extremely important for survival of mountain lions. And further research is needed to take uh, the correct management decisions because in, in strict terms, from the point of view of, con of conservation, we should try to eradicate or at least control hares and rabbits to, to protect vegetation and to favor recovery of native uh, mammals uh, like scatchers or even small mammals, uh, uh, native mammals. But, but now hares and rabbits are the main prey of the puma and foxes. So it's not that easy that, that, that recommendation to, to take into account. In this particular area, Rio Cipreses National Reserve, we conclude that the guanaco is ecologically extinct as a prey in the study area for pumas. And, and that's complicated because we suspect that there is some apparent competition between guanaco and hares, where hares are supplying the food to sustain higher densities of puma than the ones that guanacos can afford to, to, to survive from their predation pressure but it's extremely difficult to find carcasses of guanacos because the numbers are now, we believe, below 50 or 40 animals in an area that is over 40,000 hectares. <clears throat> and so going into another, another area of our work, this is just an overview of our work. Uh, I would like to invite you to visit our website or to see our papers and videos that we have in our website about the specific projects. I was invited to this webinar to give an overview of our work after many years working in Puma. It's not specific, but in education for conservation, and I stress the word education for conservation and not environmental education, which I think is a broader issue, a broader field of, of, of work, and, and we're far from being teachers or specialists in education, but creating awareness about conservation, I would say more than education. Uh, we have done many activities in terms of producing a series of books called the Fauna Australis series, which are all free books available online for as PDF files, and we're always given for free to people in local areas, regional areas, our students. And we have done training and mitigation efforts as well, working with the government authorities producing a forensic manual to identify predation by puma, foxes, and free roaming dogs. In environmental education, all sorts of ideas, uh, talks to school children by our graduate students. It, it, it is within our philosophy as research lab in our grad program, is that regardless the topic that you choose to work on wildlife in our lab, one of the chapters of your work, a part of the scientific work, should consider an intervention or a contribution to the community where your study is being done. Either it's going to be published as a paper or not, it's not a point, it's not the point, but we stress the importance of our graduate students to contribute to the local communities. In that way, we have all sorts of seminars, workshops, talks, and visits to schools 
explaining the activities uh, regarding our wildlife conservation work. In this case, one of my PhD, former PhD students explaining the importance of pumas and guanacos and so forth. Also, we do uh, play a lot of efforts on maintaining a good collaboration with park rangers and, and local uh, wildlife conservationists. And we were one of the first groups that used camera traps in Chile many years ago. And the first camera trapping efforts and training for park rangers were done by us uh, more than a decade ago. And now CONAF, our park ranger service, uh, has a wonderful system of monitoring with camera traps in many protected areas. In terms of publications, as I said, this is one of the, of the books. This is a handbook about how to study mountain lions or how to study carnivores. And this is a book that is useful for uh, year, first year students in the university. It's a PDF file looking at different aspects of the, the Puma in the Altiplano. <clears throat> and this is the first forensic manual about predation detection and verification of livestock done by us for the government of Chile, for the wildlife service of Chile. And they use this verification manual uh, in the whole country to identify the causes of death and the, uh, whether it's by puma, dog, or fox. And it's also a PDF file. So it is a strict protocol to identify the likely causes of death of an animal. Uh, before we go to the side note of pumas in the city, I just want to say that in Chile, we have a very specific problem of, and a very worrying problem that is becoming a global problem as well, which is the, the fact that dogs that are abandoned uh, in rural areas or outside cities uh, tend to become packs of free roaming dogs and because of poor legislation um, in our country that was uh, heavily uh, influenced by extremist group, animal rights groups, we have legislation that is not tackling the problem of free roaming dogs. It's not, it's not doing anything for, for wildlife in terms of protecting wildlife in rural areas. And free roaming dogs are becoming a ma major threat to all sorts of species in our country, and even pumas. This is a picture taken nearby Torres del Paine National Park. It, it is just a crop section of the picture, but there are two other dogs on top of the cliff uh, chasing this juvenile mountain lion. It does a, an entire, uh, a, entire topic that I'm working on, feral domestic animals and their impact on biodiversity. And so just to conclude, we have gained in the understanding of the relationship between local communities and pumas in contrasting ecosystems and culturally different communities. We know how puma adapt to different prey availability. And we have contributed to a national protocol for livestock predation assessment. And new ecological questions are coming now regarding climate change, regarding how this highly resilient predator is going to change to face a new challenge which is free roaming dogs and thanks to all my co-authors and students and former students who have made possible this work in, in, in about mountain lions and now we will try to show you a few videos two videos actually and let's see if it works <laughs> this is uh, oh Yes, I'll show you the video first. Let's see if it works. I would look into, I hope you, you now should see, um, you should see now a video about uh, the Puma in, in Santiago. I lost the, I lost the message board. Can you see the video? Yes, we can see it. You see full screen? We do. Yeah, okay. So these are people from the Wildlife Service explaining that the Puma entered the city because it was in a lockdown because of the coronavirus uh, problem. 
And this is a highly dense area of Santiago. It's not the outskirts of Santiago. It's right in the middle of, of the city. And it was an, a surprising finding that in less than two weeks, there were four pumas that had to be captured by the, the Wildlife Service and the National Zoo to rescue them from the city. But this one was really spectacular that it was visiting areas that are highly dense. You see here in the map <clears throat> that the mountains connect to the Metropolitan Park. And in that, in that area, you, you see that they, he might cross and enter the city. And then he was unable to escape from the city because he was in the middle of the city. Finally, police was escorting the mountain lion in, uh, during the whole night. And in the morning, it was captured outside a house underneath a car by the zoo people. So <clears throat> because of the international interest and national interest on this problem or in this event, actually there were four pumas. And I will, we, we, ha we had to do something as university and we, we did a video explaining the, the importance of, of protecting puma and the situation of puma on, in Chile. So let me see if I can show you the video now. Uh, can you see full screen? No, no, it's your email. And uh, now? Nope. Try once more. We had oh, it no, earlier, we'll didn't we? In a minute. Bear with me. And now you will see. Perfect. Full yes. Screen, right. Yes. Yes. So in this video, which is for our, from our university, we explain the importance of Puma as a top predator that lives from the north of Chile, the Altiplano, to Magallanes. We explain people that they are in conflict with livestock, but we also say that our research demonstrates that most of the time they live on native prey or hares and, and rabbits and invasive species. And we also explain that na native prey have been disappearing but they also prey on those animals rather than livestock, and they are not a dangerous animal for people. So <clears throat> we also call uh, for attention that illegal hunting is still occurring, and, and then we make a comment about a puma as an important member of our ecosystems, a controller of invasive species, and contributes to protect grasslands and, and protect nature. And so this, this, this um, video was done for pu public media because people were really interested on in the situation of Pumas during the lockdown. So just to finish and close this presentation, thank you for your patience. Uh, <clears throat> just to, to see whether I can show you a little bit of of the <clears throat> of the situation where the puma was actually uh, walking or wandering. <clears throat> now you see the last that is live from my talk, right? Can you see yeah. a full screen of a building now? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> this is the the area where the puma crisscrossed the city from the Metropolitan Park, which is on the left, and enter the, the county of Providencia in the city. So <clears throat> in this map, uh, you see my, 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 my cursor. This is a Metropolitan Park that enters the city. It's more than 700 hectares of, as a hilly area. And we think that the animal came from the, from the mountains looking for food enter the Metropolitan Park, which is also a zoo, the Metropolitan Zoo, and then enter the city into this area, which is highly populated area. A close-up of the, of the area shows system of highways. So the Puma probably crosses cross underneath and enter a, 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 in the evening, at night, streets like this one and this one. So it was a person in his car who saw the puma walking. <laughs> he thought that it was a dog first and then realized it was a puma. And then the police was escorting the puma until they captured the puma overnight. Uh, 
nothing happened to the puma. The puma was uh, taken to the rehabilitation center of our national zoo. We have a world-class national zoo, very, very good in terms of management and, 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 and perfect. Uh, usually they receive more than a thousand animals for rehabilitation from small birds to pumas. And, <clears throat> and then it was released back, to, released back to the wild in the mountain areas. So I think that was all that I wanted to say to you tonight. And I thank you for having me in this webinar series. Thank you, Christian. That was, that was really great. And uh, those who have joined us previously may be familiar with uh, our situation in San Francisco, which is quite similar to what you described in Santiago. So uh, very interesting. I think we have a few questions and who's gonna help me ask those? Ginger or Courtney? I can um, field those questions. Right. Um, thanks for a great talk. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Donna who is asking, photo tours will tell you, you will see a puma if you go. Are pumas not in danger as they are here in the US from being shot or trapped? Well, photo tours that are offering you to see pumas, almost 100% chance are basically the tours that goes to Torres del Paine National Park. Torres del Paine National Park is in Patagonia. It's in the very south of Chile. And, and it's a, a very interesting case of high density of puma that had recovered thanks to the protection for 30 years. Sorry? Excuse me? Keep going. Yeah, keep okay. going. Sorry. So, <clears throat> so in Torres del Paine National Park, the likelihood of finding a puma is very, very high in a particular area of the park. And now uh, uh, we're collaborating with, with Pantera in, from the US and Dr. Omar Orleans is working in, into the, the relationship of tourism and the distribution and likely consequences of this kind of tourism on the populations of Puma because they are actually very, very, very common now. That particular area of Chile has the highest density of Puma in the entire continent. But this is a work in progress that I'm not going to give any results yet because we're just working since last year. Great, thanks. Um, we have another question from um, Ben. He says, last week's webinar talked about how pumas are finding success in suburban areas because they provide a stable food source. Have you observed a similar relationship between pumas and the suburbs in Chile? Well, the pumas, in a way, they are, are like the snow leopards because they, they use the peaks of the mountains and they traverse and move large areas and depending on the amount of, of, of prey that they find and their cursorial behavior, they, they tend to move from highlands to lowlands when winter is, is harsh and the level of the snow is high in the, in the Andes of central Chile. So it is not uncommon that pumas visit uh, suburbs and visit the outskirts of Santiago every year and, and the amount of sightings relates with the amount of people living further and further away inside the mountains nearby Santiago or in agricultural lands that used to be areas for livestock and, and crops. And now you have houses with swimming pools and large gardens. And people are starting to see pumas that probably were visiting those areas forever. So the, the degree of habitat fragmentation on the lowlands or the plains of some nearby Santiago is obviously contributing to have more encounters of pumas with, with, with people. And it's every year we, 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 we found and we have pumas on the news. Uh, luckily, we don't have the problem of attacks of pumas to people or the fear of people to be attacked by pumas. Uh, the, the cover, the tree cover and the shrubland cover and the vegetation cover of, 
nearby Santiago is not very thick. We don't have large forests uh, like you have in California and in, in the northern part of California. Uh, <clears throat> so pumas tend to be in the hills. They're very secretive. Uh, many studies have shown that pumas can pass close by a house and dogs don't even bark. And so it's very, it, it is common. I think pumas are very resilient animals, very, very resilient species, and, and they, they are able to reproduce. And we know for sure that illegal, illegal hunting still exists in Chile, um, because some of the animals that have been ready color soon die or come back injured or sick. And, and, and they are harassed by people in, in rural areas for sure, for sure. They, they are protected by law, but the enforcement is very poor. Still, they, they are present. Great, thanks. Um, we have two more questions. Um, first one is from Patrick. He said, I learned that the presence of Texas Longhorn cattle bulls have been shown to preliminary promise as a deterrent for jaguar depredation of domestic livestock elsewhere. Might this be a potential intervention here? Sorry, missed the beginning of the question. Um, basically, he's asking whether um, Texas longhorn cattle bulls might be a good deterrent for pumas. Well, that's a very interesting question. What is a deterrent for pumas depends on the context, right? Because many years ago, people brought llamas to the US 20 years ago, and they used llamas as, as guards for protecting livestock from being hunted by pumas. And llamas are the preferred prey of pumas in, in, in the altiplano of Chile. So uh, guard dogs have been used in, in Chile too, with some promising uh, results. And I think, <clears throat> uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the, the best way to protect livestock from predators is how you manage your livestock and how you take care of your livestock in the context that you are. We don't have a single bullet to solve the problems between predators and prey, livestock, uh, domestic livestock uh, around the world. It's all context dependent. And and the more that we learn about conflict resolution between carnivores and, and farmers, we rely, realize that the surroundings, the type of habitat, whether it's forest, it's tropical or temperate, uh, whether there are rocks or areas where predators can jump on top of the, of the, of the prey, the livestock, whether you have a good sanitary management program of your animals and you move the animals at night, you have herders, you have guard dogs, uh, all these things together act as a good way to deter or decrease the conflict between carnivores and, uh, and, and livestock. It's not a single solution or not a single uh, action which solves the problem. We did a survey and, and an analysis about human wildlife conflicts, an overview of cases and lessons from the Andean region in this book, Tropical Conservation, and, and there we review the problems of pumas and jaguars and, and a spectacle bear in, 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 this, in the southern corn of South America. And, and, and there isn't a single solution. All depends not just how bad a top predator can act against your livestock from the point of view of a farmer. Also depends how poorly you act as a farmer. And in many cases, in, in remote areas, small farm, farming activities or small household farming activities, the causes of death and the, the management of the livestock actually relates more to diseases or poor nutrition as the main reason why they are not successful economically rather than eventual predations of pumas or jaguars from time to time. So we need to look at to this problem eh, from the whole, from all points of view, from the farmer point of view, from the veterinarian side, from the biologist or conservation side, and from the context of the habitat or surrounding and landscape where the animals are placed for grazing or 
or breeding the animals, right? Also, the season of the year is critical. For example, we have huge problems with mountain lions because when foals are born in, in, in the mountains nearby Santiago, pumas even kill all of them in one season. Okay, one more question. It is not a Puma question, um, but uh, we have a question that says, how could the, con the population of introduced rabbits be controlled? I live in Santiago and they are everywhere. How we can control rabbits? Yeah, rabbits. Yeah, yeah well, <clears throat> uh, rabbits are considered an alien species and they are not protected by the hunting law, like the casa in Spanish. So there are some companies that help you to control rabbits, but depends where you are, because if you are inside the, the urban area, you are not allowed to use poison or you're not allowed to do things like the things that they use in pine tree plantations, for example. Depends on the context where you are. But I would be happy if I have rabbits in my garden anyway. All right. Thank you so much, Christian. I think we're going to let people go. And if you, he's got some resources up here on the screen. And if you need further resources, reach out to us and we're happy to connect you to Christian. And thank you everyone for joining and have a good evening again. We'll, we'll see you soon, hopefully next week. Thank you. Goodbye. Take care. Thank you so much, Christian. <laughs>